Hello, we are live. Duvid here with uh, my co-host of Week in Review, Jennifer, Church of Entropy. And uh, haven't done too many streams on my channel uh, recently, uh, but uh, I have been doing regular Week in Review for you know, a few years now on uh, Jennifer's channel, channel on Sundays. And uh, you know, we've been advancing a lot of research. I had put out streams um months ago on the you know multiple truth hypothesis and, and most recently just some chess streams um but i wanted to get back into the research and i thought we'd do a public study session on a topic that keeps on coming up and also to you know to advance uh, the theories that uh, in in reality uh you know something that would be published or more for academia is going to be mostly equations and it's going to have a lot of math and complicated things although it's understandable on an intuitive level. So today we're going to be doing somewhat of an arithmetic uh, um, tutorial on starting with very basic stuff that even uh, you know young kids might understand the unit circle and uh, the sphere up to like calculus three uh, stuff that would be like uh, spherical coordinates, triple integrals, and just how the sphere is understood and designed. And then I'm also going to mention some more complicated ideas that hopefully we'll be talking about in the future, like the, the Riemann sphere and uh, conformal mapping or uh, spherical projections that will be more useful for stuff in the future that uh, we're going to be talking about. And, you know, me, me and Jennifer have been doing a lot of stuff, more debate, I guess, and esoteric and uh, talking a lot about dualism and kind of the, the dichotomy of the spiritual and material realm. And so we mentioned a lot the Platonic solids and, uh, and, and various concepts of, of the ancients. And a lot of people don't realize that what we learn in math class, that this is actually what the people who came up with these theories themselves said. So it's not like, you know, Duvid and Jennifer are mystics and believe in spiritual stuff. I mean, we do, uh, but uh, I'm going to try to express what the people like uh, Euler, uh, Leibniz, uh, who came up with these theories actually said and uh, this kind of concept of dualism of a spiritual and material realm uh, could be somewhat understood as the connection between the algebra and geometry, meaning to say that you have shapes that uh, you know we're all familiar with, like the circle and sphere, and then we have equations in algebraic form that define these shapes and the in in to try to understand in a more complicated way. So we're not going to be talking too much about spirituality. It's going to be basically straightforward math. And then hopefully maybe this will kick off uh, Jennifer on her own channel, possibly a series of streams that would uh, you know, be more educational and you know general trying to get people who are interested in understanding these ideas up to speed on uh, mathematics. But obviously, you know, people who want to, to know mathematics have to do the work to go through it. You can take courses, enroll in school, take online courses. Uh, but we just, for our own uh, you know, benefit review and to have these ideas quickly on our head for, for use and, uh, you know, as a public uh, a public uh, you know, benefit, as a, a good deed just to put some educational material out there. So uh, why don't I let Jennifer say any introductory remarks and then I'll say quickly, a little bit of itinerary of what we hope we'll cover, and then we'll jump right in. Hello, thanks for having me. Looking forward to this uh, educational stream. And I don't really have anything to say right now, but I will be ready to start once you've done your introduction. Okay. Um... The uh, yeah, so I, I plan on covering. You know, we're going to start with just what is a circle, the unit circle, and uh, um, the basics of trigonometry. Like, like uh, you know, what is a circle? What are the trigonometrical functions? And then we're going to look at the sphere, and then we're going to look at uh, how to define points on a sphere within trigonomical functions. And uh, you know, this will be the connection between. Um, as I said, algebra and geometry, which I'm kind of giving as a parallel to um, the spiritual, to uh, material realm. And 
and you were also going to cover some more advanced things like uh, how to derive the polar and spherical coordinates and, and hopefully actually, you know, partly recruited Jennifer to help me with the math. So, uh, you yeah, I think she prepared and we're going to show, uh, you know, if, if people aren't familiar, the, you know, what's polar coordinates and spherical coordinates. And then uh, you, we're not going to be doing a calculus tutorial, uh, but maybe I have briefly prepared also, you know, how to derive uh, the sphere from uh, from calculus in terms of the integral and uh and also if people are familiar with the famous uh, euler formula you know it's uh, one of the most famous formulas which is e to the i pi equals negative one so i'm going to go over a proof of uh, that we're also going to be talking about uh just very basic uh, pyramid uh parametric equation of a circle where you have uh x and y defined in terms of time and these things are all going to be you know useful for stuff that we've already been talking about and are going to be talking about more in the future then i want to uh um mention some much more complicated things uh, that are, are going to be things that i'm studying now uh, that were, were kind of the maximum of my university study that, that uh, was beyond my time ability but i've had some time to research and uh um Riemann sphere and uh, mapping and uh, projections, which are very interesting, but these things are, you know, advanced to graduate school level mathematics, even beyond uh, you know, my understanding of math, uh, you know, to perform calculations. Um, so uh, with that, I'm going to do a screen share and if Jennifer wants to say anything, feel free. And then we'll start with uh, with some very basics. Are you done saying all you had to say about mysticism? Yeah, just I'm not, not going to be talking about mysticism. I just, addendum. from from my perspective, that uh, uh, algebra to geometry could be understood as algebra is the spiritual realm, geometry is the material realm. It's funny because I would have put it, I would have said the opposite. But anyway... If I can just screen share for one little teeny tiny explanation that this like <laughs> people can't tell the difference between absolute and relative knowledge because most of what we have access to is relative like math because it doesn't go outside of uh, particularly constrained axiomatic varietals. Uh, you really are in a relative domain. Like if you've ever done any type of proof, you get the sense of being in a relativized domain because it's like, oh, I better just start at the conclusion and work my way backwards. And it's like, wait a minute, there should be some absolute, um, uh, sorry, I forget the word here, some type of a, I was going to say crutch, but it's more of a, a thing that a boat drops out when they're going to sleep. Not a hook, but a, Anyway, the thing you drop down that's really heavy in a boat anchor. that holds the boat. Thank you, an anchor. It's an anchor. You need a metaphysical anchor to make everything make sense. And as you draw towards the anchor, which is at the top of the diagram, you're getting towards more absolute, non-dual knowledge. And that's why I tried to make a little distinction here that... It's pretty easy to deal with relativized knowledge because that's what we have direct quote, you know. Ugh, yeah, thanks, Scott S. <laughs> Cringe. Uh, yeah, so we basically are at a point where we've sort of dissuaded ourselves the importance of metaphysics, so that it's very easy to draw false equivalences between relativized knowledge and absolute knowledge. So the point of learning calculus here isn't to say, well, the universe functions on the basis of calculus. Well, it's actually the opposite. It's to see why it doesn't and how sometimes it actually makes sense to model the universe with something other than calculus. AKA it's only actually legit to model using calculus under certain very specific circumstances. And that's where the universe matches your calculus precepts, right? Your axioms. So basically this is why as you get to the more foundational attributes knowledge, it's because sort of like, I don't want to say the walls close in, but there's, it's harder. It's requires these, you know, drawn out, I don't want to say horrible conversations, but conversations that can very easily go in a horrible direction. So just to say that math is maybe some way to like bridge the gap to the, towards the root knowledge in a more objective, less emotional way. So it's maybe a great template for future work in the direction of 
root knowledge if that's something that you're interested in, which, you know, it's good to understand most people aren't interested in, and that's all right, because, uh, you know, if everyone was interested in it, we wouldn't be special, would we, right? Anyway, just wanted to say that real quick about math. I don't know if I agree with you on the geometry, algebra, metaphor with the spiritual and material, but hope we can develop more later, and thanks. Yes, I, I didn't really want to... Uh, um talk too much about uh, the philosophy of mathematics uh, today, although, you know, I just wanted to put it out there and, you know, if it, me and Jennifer have different understandings of it, uh, that's fine. Um, so let's jump right in. Can you see my screen share? Yeah, it's looking good. Okay. So these are all things I found this, you know, generic. So here would be an X, Y plane, um, with a circle and, uh, you know, so here's your basic degrees, which is the old Babylonian system of 0 to 360, which could be considered arbitrary, um, versus um, pi, which uh, in a, a 360 grid, it takes 2 pi to get around the circle. So uh, you know, if you're going from 0, 1 on the x-axis to... Uh, one zero to zero one to negative one zero, which is pi, and then back around um, is is two pi, and then I'll also show quickly the Pythagorean theorem. I have another slide for that, but uh, your your basic uh, triangles that make up these circles that that uh, if you look, the points on the circle are all right triangles that you could any point on the circle, uh, you know, besides the, the zero one, the top point, which is just a line, forms a right triangle, which is uh, applicable to the Pythagorean theorem. And from there, you could derive the lengths. And, you know, so example, 30 degrees, uh, you know, the, the radius is always one because it's a circle. And then here you have half and the square root of three over two. And uh, anyone who's familiar with the uh, basic uh, trigonometry, let's say these are the solutions to uh, the trigonometric the trigono uh, uh, formulas of like sine of 30, uh, cosine of 30, 60, and we'll cover the basic uh, trigonometry. And then on the negative side, it's the same, uh, but uh, with negatives. And, uh, you know, so here you could see the complete unit circle showing uh, the point. So if you had, as I said, the X, Y graph, that if you have a thing as a circle, but when you put the circle as an equation of uh, which would be uh, X squared plus Y squared equals R squared, in this case uh, of a unit circle being one, that uh, the various points on the circle on a graph, you know, these are the points. And, uh, and these would also be the solutions to the basic uh, trigonomet uh, trigonometric uh, function. So this is, you know, about is basic. You know, this is what you call the unit circle. And, uh, you know, when you learn trigonometry, like uh, I, I learned this stuff, you know, high school, even ninth, 10th grade. Uh, but, uh, you know, whenever you learn basic uh, pre-algebra, algebra, you know, you learn about the circle and the degrees and the Pythagorean theorem. And here's your unit circle. I don't know if you had any, any comments on, you know, the most basic, uh, you know, what is the unit circle? Are you going to get to the cast rule at some point? Did you want me to cover that? Because I've got that basically ready to go. I'm right not now. even sure what the cast rule is, but. Uh, it's a shorthand for these ratios of the okay, unit so, circle. So let Did me. Do you want to finish what you wanted to say? Like, how much longer do you have to do in the unit circle? Um. Well, so let me show this one on. The Pythagorean theorem. So, are so, you done on the unit circle? Because if you're done on the unit circle, I still have something to say on the unit circle before you move on. Yeah. So, I, I just want to go back to the Pythagorean. Is that theorem. yes or no? We're not done with the circle. We're not though. done with the unit circle okay. because, because the unit circle is dependent on Pythagorean theorem. I had another link. I'll put this one into the chat, and uh, because the, the really the Pythagorean theorem predates. The understanding of the unit circle and these uh, points on the chart were originally, you know, discovered through the Pythagorean theorem. 
and I remember I took calculus three in University of Michigan, I'm actually still friends on Facebook with uh, my professor. And he made us come up with our own unique proof of the Pythagorean theorem. It was simple a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And, and this one has uh, like 30 some proofs. And you could see uh, some geometric uh, you know, versions of just understanding what does it mean that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And uh, you, you, so when you saw the unit circle and we had the various points, all these values, uh, you know, especially the ones that have the square roots, are from Pythagorean theorem. And, uh, you know, so historically, so, uh, you know, I, I assume everyone knows, anyone watching this is more than familiar with uh, Pythagorean's theorem. So I just thought this was an uh, important uh, thing to show. So I'll let uh, Jennifer do a screen share if she wants. If you had something to show, and then and then the next thing I'm going to do is move into the sphere. Right. So we didn't really talk about. Um, I mean, this is important. Okay, there's a couple of important things here to remember. So here's your standard. I got two of them up here. Sign conventions. Um, we need that if we're going to do any calculus at all, we need the sign conventions more or less down pat. So when you're talking about one of these, you've got there's your sign convention. Anti-clockwise rotation. So you're always starting relative to the positive x-axis. Why? Sign convention. Then you got the cast rule where you start out with an angle here, which would just be a generic angle. I know it says pi over six, but uh, it works for any angle less than 90. And you draw out your bow tie here. And the absolute value of the, ra uh, the various ratios of all these angles will be the same. So the sine, the cosine, the tangent, all the same. So... Are you following so far, David? Have you heard this one before? I think so. I mean, maybe you're describing yeah. a slightly different way. So it's called the cast rule because the cosines are positive in this quadrant. They're all positive in this quadrant. Sine is positive in uh, this quadrant. And then tangent is positive here. So it's like a shorthand to know. I mean, with computers, you don't really need to know this stuff, blah, blah, blah. I just think it's, I, I like knowing the mnemonics. Like, I think there's value to doing these things without uh, calculators and computers just to memorize numbers, almost like uh, multiplication tables, just to keep the mind sharp in ba very basic numerical reasoning. But I guess that's neither here nor there. So I just wanted to draw attention to that. Sign convention as well as the cast rule when you're actually solving problems. Yep, and that's all I had to say. Okay, yeah, I mean, so this is, the unit circle is very basic, and uh, um, as I said, most people learn this, you know, as young kids, and, you know, so it's, it's kind of basic to the sphere. So let me show something. It's more basic to like a signal because you think of the unit sphere as the angle of perpetually increasing. It goes from zero to 360, but it can keep going, right? 720 and on and on and on. And then you think of when you are mapping a generic signal and you're extending the x-axis out to infinity that you're sort of, it's a projection on a farther distant value of x from zero of the unit sphere. That's yeah, the important thing is that you can go from a finite, infinite rotational array to if or sorry infinite rotational array to an infinite spatial array theoretically that's yeah, the key so, takeaway with this units uh, circle go ahead yeah I'm, I'm going over this stuff for my own purposes for my own things i'm trying to advance which is going to be important for if you were taking this in school you would be more computative like for example here is uh something i, I found just, they're pretty good slides out of Baghdad. Um, this would be from a Calculus three class. Um, and uh, you could see fourth lecture in uh, Calculus three, cylindrical and spherical coordinates. And uh, you know, so you'd have a bunch of questions and uh, you know, being able to calculate answers 
correctly because the philosophy of mathematics um, doesn't necessarily matter for how we understand things. And uh, you know, it's more computative that, that we're expected to be able to compute answers uh, correctly in any metaphor that helps a student understand it better. And that people could understand it in their own way uh, philosophically. It's uh, you know, occasionally you might have a, a question on like the philosophy of math in in university, but very very rarely. So uh, um, let's get into more complicated things very quickly. So I, I found these slides pretty good. And we talk about a, a coordinate system, so a reference systems, for example, like uh, like the globe, and uh, you know, for the coordinate system really historically comes much later. It's you know, like uh, the Cartesian coordinate system, Descartes, uh, Fermi, um, the origin of the equation is really only three, 400 years old for how we modernly understand these things. Um, but in terms of an equation that we have like an X equals Y, uh, a, a, uh, Y equals MX plus B describing any line, um, you know, so also you have equation of a cylinder and a sphere, and uh, there's coordinate systems where you could describe instead of a typical XY system, you could have radius and angle, and you know that's polar coordinates. And then when you take that to three dimensional, you have what's called cylindrical symmetry, a uh, cylindrical coordinate system, and spherical. So cylindrical system is polar coordinates with radius and angle, and then a Z is the same as a, a height. And spherical symmetry has two angles, uh, one in, so to say, the X, Y plane and a radius, and then another angle, which would be from the X, Y plane to the Z plane. And, uh, you know, if you think like longitude and latitude on Earth, is an example of a spherical coordinate system. It's very important. Um, so here's a, you know, a nice diagram. I was looking through for a whole bunch of stuff, try, just trying to find nice diagrams. So this, uh, you know, just calculus course from Baghdad had online versions that were pretty good. And uh, so you have the basic, you know, your point P exists in, you know, X, Y, Z, as opposed to cylindrical, which has the angle from the origin and a radius and then a height. And the spherical has two angles and the radius. And uh, here's your conversion factors. If people remember this, uh, you know, from maybe high school or maybe if you, you had to have taken calculus three, a lot of times uh, you, they, you don't really cover this in calculus one and two, and then they throw it at you in uh, calculus three. Um, and, and sometimes in high school, pre-calculus or algebra, they give you polar coordinates, just throw it at you. Uh, but once you get into higher level mathematics, um, you end up using polar coordinates, cylindrical coordinates all the time because circular spherical motion is extremely common. And then in terms of solving problems, uh, many problems are much easier to solve, especially if it involves a sphere using spherical coordinates. And so, you know, to convert cylindrical uh, from a regular X, Y, Z coordinate system to cylindrical coordinates, you have the simple conversion factor, X equals radius times cosine theta, Y equals uh, R times sine theta, and the Z coordinate for the height is the same. And uh, for your spherical coordinate system, it gets a little bit more complicated because you end up having two angles times each other, where the X coordinate is now rho, because not the radi radius is staying for the radius on the XY plane. Rho becomes the radius um, in the three-dimensional plane times sine of theta, sine of, uh, um, I forget what that, uh, even the, the Greek, the, uh, phi. Theta, phi times theta. So phi is the angle in the xy coordinate, I mean, uh, theta is the angle. I think that theta will remain the angle in the xy coordinate, and phi uh, in the z coordinate system. And this is just Pythagorean's coordinate system. That if you're looking, why would x equal 
a sine times a cosine uh, because you know, Pythagorean's theorem or the pure definition of trigonometry, uh, trigonometric functions like Jennifer showed uh, that, uh, that uh, you have a right angle triangle and uh, and those are are the you know basic definition. So our uh, uh, row here you have r equals x squared plus y squared equals z squared. But I guess the r here is actually uh, your row, and then your tangent function. We we, we talk a little bit more about uh, trigonometric. Uh, I'm function. concerned. At the, can you go back one second? I, there might be an error here because my textbook is telling me. That phi is uh, between zero and pi. I could be wrong, but that is how I remember it too. It says two pi there because I, I did want to call attention to this important aspect. Yeah, that rho is not r. Yeah, I think right? there might, like you said, because r is a two-dimensional, and even if you're going into the three-dimensional equivalent of polar coordinates, it's still not rho. R yeah, is it's not too time row, consuming is... for me to make my own slide, so I just looked. No, it's fine. I, I'm not suggesting you make your own slide. I just want to call attention to this important thing about the integral bounds when you're talking about spherical coordinates is you're literally having to go through every angle in the sphere, every independent angle. All right. That's all I had to say. Okay, so here... In cylindrical coordinate system, for example, you know, simple, if your equation is just R equals one, you have a cylinder, uh, a hollow cylinder of uh, of radius one. And if you divide an equation that had theta and just an angle, pi equals three, it's not a full plane because it would only be projecting from the axis in one direction. But at that angle, you would have a plane starting at the z-axis projecting at the direction then if you had z equals four you would have a a plane at a, at a various uh, direction and uh in spherical coordinates if you just had uh, you, uh row equals one that's the equation of a sphere so so as i said in uh regular cartesian coordinate system the equation of a sphere is x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals one and the benefit in spherical coordinates is it uh, the equation is just one that the row equals one and that is the equation of a sphere using spherical coordinate systems and uh, I, I guess also the plane if you have just so unfortunately there's errors uh, in in, uh, in this chart I found so you know it's difficult to to it would it take uh, too much work for the purpose of the stream to make my uh, make my own slide so it looks like there's some errors in this. Um, and then you can see the type sh uh, shape if you have uh, um, phi, uh, like being an angle here, pi divided by four gives you a cone. And then you have cones that would uh, be emerging in both uh, both directions also. And you know, because I took this from a university course, you know, it has a bunch of uh, questions. So, you know, if, if, when I took calculus in school, uh, they had a bunch of questions. And uh, I used, me and Jennifer both used to tutor questions. And I remember University of Michigan, I used to sit in the math lab and just uh, volunteer, help people out. And you have these kind of weird questions about uh, intersecting shapes, like a sphere, a crossover between a sphere, or a cylinder, or various things. And you have to decide what the best coordinate system is to use. And then um, sometimes you'd have to, usually you'd have to set it up as an integral and it'd be some sort of like subtraction where you'd have one shape and then you have to subtract the other shape. And these are the type of questions that, uh, you know, people do in university math. But, uh, you know, do a bunch of these questions. You, the point is to become uh, very familiar with the techniques and to be able to make calculations of so you eventually move into engineering. And, um, you know, the goal, as I say, that, that you, you don't really work with shapes like in engineering um, you work with equations. So in, in practical engineering, you work with objects and objects exist in shape. Uh, but in terms of, uh, you know, the engineering side of engineering, you don't work with objects, you work with equations. So being able to convert shapes into equations is, uh, you know, a key skill. So that's why in 
university, they make you do hundreds and hundreds of problems. Like my father, you know, he said, you really want to do well, you got to do all the problems in the back of the chapter and you do hundreds of these problems and, you know, you become quite uh, masterful at uh, working with these coordinate systems that uh, you would be able to take a shape and um, determine the best way to define its equation, uh, whether that be, you know, what coordinate system would be the best coordinate system to define it in and, uh, you know, the spherical, and then, uh, you know, if you're actually trying to then do physics with it, uh, you know, applying laws as opposed to just defining geometric shapes. So, uh, you know, so here you have the basics of the coordinate system. So I'm not sure if, uh, did you prepare, or did you want to do like a, a whiteboard on, of, uh, on this? Probably not a bad idea. Are we going to start with a uh, polar? Um, whatever you want. Or you just want me to go into spherical? Yeah, I, mean, I think, you know, we didn't really, we sort of breezed through polar, but there's polar and then there's the three dim dimensional version of polar, right? And that is cylindrical. And cylindrical is really important for maps. I took an entire course on uh, map making and math and uh, really enjoyed it. And so we learned about uh, stereographic projection, mercator projection. I, I think that may be the same thing, but stuff like that. So really important thing we learned was the GOD6 on a sphere, the shortest distance between two points on a sphere. So anyway, all that to say that coordinate systems are super important. So the basic one that we're looking at is XY, which we've seen a lot of times. So that's orthogonal dimensionally and that's about it and then you can throw in a z too if you want which would be like that we're not going to do that right yet but anyway that's what you're basically starting at which is basic 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 uh, cartesian what are the axioms there uh the, the determining factor one appears to be the parallel lines don't ever intersect. This appears to be necessitated by basically like the backbone of these Linalge proofs, which you can see it's like, well, if these things aren't perpendicular to each other and perpendicular to functional parallelism, uh, you know, the, the whole thing basically falls apart. So it's a question of like, what is the best way? to describe a point and uh, we'll originally we just said we're going to say well here's the x coordinate and here's the y and that's going to be the ordered pair and that's it and then we discovered that doesn't actually work so well so instead we're going to throw down whoops i make that a straight line from the origin which is the point at which x and y axes intersect so these are this is so kind of called the x and y axes that sign convention doesn't really ever go away, so you're sort of just like superimposing a new coordinate system on top of the Cartesian one. So we'll we've got the R here, which is the magnitude of this uh, line. So R is not like X and Y exactly. It's a distance, but it's along the axis of the point connecting the origin. And then we have an angle, whoops, an angle, which is called theta. So we're just looking to like derive one point from the other. We invoke the sine and cosine laws to give that x is r sine theta. And then y is r cos theta, I think. Is that right? Or actually, I think I got it wrong. Help me out here. I don't even, I, I'm not the greatest at doing this thing on the fly here. All right. X is our cos theta. There we go. Made a mistake. Are you yeah, following? That's kind of why I wanted I to that? Make, make this stream so we be, have a, you know, perfection of this. Because, uh, you know, when I was in University of Michigan, I did this tens, hundreds, of, hundreds of times even, you know, people walking people through uh, the basics and it's very easy to mix this up and you know just have this clear in our heads for our own purposes and uh, 
you know, something relatively, this is pretty basic. It builds off each other. And, uh, you know, when you error in the smaller elements, when it gets to the more complicated elements, uh, you know, I said that, uh, you know, it, people learn arithmetic to uh, algebra, uh, trigonometry, calculus, and any mistake in any of the elements will give you the wrong answer. So, you know, mathematics requires uh, precision. So, you know, that's part of the reason we're going through this. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, really want to talk about more complicated things. Both of us are out of university for a while, don't work in mathematical fields where we use this daily. So it's partially a review for us. And, uh, and you know, so I appreciate, uh, you know, like I said, like 10 years ago, I did this probably hundreds of times just tutoring people, but I haven't done it in a decade. So that's about it. Um, that works when you're uh, with a spinning system with a fixed radius and a continuously varying angle. And uh, there's no change to the Z coordinate for this one when you go into 3D. And uh, yeah, probably I just wanted to remind people how I got that relation through the Sokotoa mnemonic device where the sine ratio is opposite over hypotenuse, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, tangent is opposite over adjacent. So the cosine of theta would be the y coordinate. I can't believe I made a, I made another mistake. Put x instead of y. This is uh, probably like this is probably danger zone for me to try to do so many to try to think about so many things at once. You know, mistakes all over the place. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm just gonna fix it. My computer stops freezing. But anyway, it's supposed to be a y. Y is the vertical one and X is the horizontal one. And no. And this might be asking just a bit too much for my computer in terms of processing power, but here we go. Okay, so Y coordinate, R sine theta, X coordinate, R cos theta. And you could just easily convert between them. This one is not that complicated. The one I, I find the, the spherical one's a little bit harder to, to work with, but you got to think of it as a reverse engineering thing. You're starting with the system and it has a certain type of symmetry. It can have a spherical symmetry or it can have a cylindrical sy symmetry. So something spinning around with a constant radius. Now, if that's the case, then the spherical or cylindrical coordinate system will be a better modeling fit in terms of computational complexity for that particular system. So this is all relative to the system. Very important thing to remember. So I'll go to the next demo, which will be the spherical coordinate system. So I have to draw this one in 3D. So let's keep our fingers crossed that I can actually do this. So are you familiar with the 3D array? I'm assuming, I'm assuming yes, David. Um, Zed's up here, I think. And yeah, I think so. I mean, some, because me and Jennifer are in different places. I'm, I'm just seeing her green screen. And uh, a lot of times you have different terminology. So, uh, and that's also part of why we're doing this to have precise terminology. So if you're familiar with this, uh, you know, something that, the, you know, the terminology that uh, how I learned it or how I read it would be familiar to the way someone else describes it. So this is the uh, rotation of the axes so that you can see all three at once, but there is, you know, 90 degree angle between everything that's not really there, but it's just presumed to be there. And then you have this circle, well, sorry, this sphere. So we're looking to plot a point um, that's a given distance from the origin that's also on the surface of the sphere here. Maybe I should make that a different color, eh? So just throw a little point on the sphere here, and then we start with the x, y, z. So the question is, how many steps down the x-axis do I need to take? Y-axis, how many steps in the direction of each axis, respectively, do I need to take to get to my point? 
and draw out this little parallelogram here. It would include the origin and all the axes and the point. And so we want to know how we go from that to, again, a distance from the origin to the point, which is a row. How many more very, uh, how many more values do we need to fully describe this point here? And since we're in R3, we know we need three coordinates. So it's a question, well, what are the, like, what are the best coordinates we could use type thing? So the way that it was deduced was to go through uh, 360 degrees on uh, the X and Y axis. So we'll be going around starting... Like I said before, you always start with a positive x-axis. So the, and the level on which they're labeled, that's the positive direction. So here you go from there. And then back again, you make that full circle rotation. I'm trying to draw it on a bit of an angle to kind of include the three-dimensionality of it. Can you see that, Duvid? Yeah, I see it fine. And uh, So know, this maybe... angle here is called theta. It is your most common angle, and it goes through 360 or 2 pi. Now you've gone in a circle, so you don't need to go, like, you do need to go into the z-axis, because you've only gone around the x-y-axis, you need to go up into 3D, but you don't need to go 360 degrees. So that's why the variation on the secondary angle goes from the positive z-axis down to the negative z-axis where you have a uh, phi is between a zero and pi, whoops, whereas theta is between zero and two pi. So that's a really important thing. I don't know, it's, it's not a sign convention, it's just a, a fact of life that, uh, that you can't have redundancy in these calculations because the calculations physically mean something and you don't want to count through angles twice. And this basic aspect of this sort of can be extrapolated to other things like models can it's easy to screw up a model and get the bounce of integration wrong if you're not doing uh what one of my colleagues likes to call a sanity check so does that help at all david yeah i mean these reviews are always useful in, in saying that you know we want to jump into really some of the most complicated ideas in the world um you know right now we're talking like the multiverse or uh, projection hol holography um which is based off of this and, and uh, you know extremely complicated if you look at a math book uh you know kind of like my father has a huge library of these math books and you see like the first chapter even as like a 10 year old kid i was able to read uh, but then you get into it and they're just pages and pages of equations that are describing very complicated uh things so it said that uh, um you know the purpose of this review uh you just to publicly put it out there put me and jennifer on the same page as we talk about uh, more complicated things, like, you know, I don't really need Jennifer's review of this basic things. I've done this uh, myself, but it's, you know, it's useful, uh, you, know, you know, just for our level of communication and uh, to put it out there as a service, people who listen to us. And, you know, if Jennifer wants to do math tutorials of, of basic things that, uh, you know, it's, it's a useful thing. I'm usually willing to sit down and explain basic math to somebody kind of like tutoring at chess or something like that. If someone has like basic questions, introduction, like how do the pieces move? I'll tell someone how the pieces move, even though I could be talking about advanced uh, strategy. So it's the same with mathematics. Um, and it's a sign of expertise to be able to take the most basic concept to the highest level. So we were talking about like the Riemann sphere or something like that, uh, to, you know, show that uh, it is based off of the you know, a simple progression of simple principles. Yeah, it's geometrically not that, uh, like intuitively, it's not that complicated, but it has a pretty complicated uh, geometry, I guess. So yeah, definitely. And he's saying esoterically, when you're looking at a descriptive factor, uh, you know, like describing something in physical space by a concept, um, which, which when we talk about like, you know, platonic, the idea existing in a separate realm or something like that, which is likely what the people who developed these theories, even up to Leibniz, believed that, you know, mathematics, algebra, 
wasn't a, a factor of the material realm. It was a factor of the spiritual realm. Uh, but to, to say, how, how can you describe a physical object? And then from that description, if it's a mathematical equation that, uh, you know, that I could send Jennifer an equation and she could, uh, um, you know, blow up the equation into a shape and she would have the exact shape that I'm talking about. And then there'd be multiple ways to describe that uh, same shape in different equations that would all produce the same result as the different uh, coordinate system, the X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared uh, versus uh, you know simpler description in spherical coordinate system where, where just rho equals one uh, is the description of a circle that would both produce the same object. Um, but the um, the axioms possibly for spherical coordinates is more complicated than the axioms for Cartesian coordinates of X, Y, Z. It's the same axiom. There's a slight, there's no difference because they're both included in the uh, Euclidean axioms. But there is a, a de facto slight difference because one being like revolution centric and one being more of a linear model. Like Cartesian plane X, Y, Z is, is very much a linear propulsion model. Can't even Whereas mention the, the other ones with the variable um, angle are all for like rotational systems. Yeah, if, if uh, you know, like Euclid, his last book is dealing with the Platonic uh, shapes, and uh, you know, he they didn't have algebra in ancient times or equations. They had maybe algorithms or kind of like recipes that if you did this, this would happen, or understandings of way to permeate permeate numbers as opposed to an abstract explanation of an object. And uh, so, you know, th that was pretty basic and saying we didn't prepare this over time. So this can just like publicly putting it out there to put me and Jennifer on the same page. And, uh, you know, we'll pro we probably will both do this in the future, uh, but you know, really want to get into more complicated topics. So with that, let's start looking at a little bit more complicated things so uh let me show one more thing here this is um what we call a parametric equation of a circle and this just has a time factor where instead of having um this is just in two dimensions, but it'd be the same in three dimension. And if we're watching week in review, like are, are you saying that theta is theta of t? Is that it? The angle is a function of time. Well, I can't quite read it. I'm just assuming that's what this is about. Because yeah, the parametric stuff super important because the fad stuff is in parametric form. Well, I mean, usually it's time as opposed to theta, and in, in the idea. Is generally well, theta is the, still there. It's just theta of t. You can't get rid of theta if you're on the unit circle. Yeah, I'm just saying that the that it is t and it is usually time. And the point of making it t in time, as opposed to having you know, so to say, an equation that matches a shape, which would be you'd have another equation that goes from zero to something else. And I guess the graphic isn't working that as t increases, the circle is formed. So if you had, um, I guess in this case, it'd be 0 to 2 pi. So if you started t at 0 and then went to 2 pi, that uh, it would draw a circle. So, so to say in parametric uh, no, notation, which is similar to vectors. I, I didn't uh, mention to cover the vectors either. But so to say, just an equation like x squared plus y squared uh, plus z squared equals 1 is a sphere. And to parametrize it, where you have uh, three different equations corresponded to a t, um, you know, if it was like x squared equals t, y squared equals t, z squared equals t, and then you have t starting at 0 and growing, that the equation would form a circle as opposed to just defining the equation, like so to say x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals uh, r, r squared is just, a, is just a sphere. 
Um, so you have the sphere as the definition of what the equation defines, as opposed to when you have it in parametric notation, that the shape somewhat forms, that it starts as a point or a, a, a curve or a solid. And then as T increases, the solid is formed as opposed to just a definition where the shape is there all at once. I'm not sure if you'd describe it differently. That was a succulent description bordering on poetry. So it's important because in reality, most things are in parametric notation when you work with them in mathematics, because you, you know, you don't just have a sphere, you have um, an object that grows. So here, if people took calculus, and I don't like the notation here. I don't know if uh, Jennifer wanted to do this. I've done this many times. Um, but if you wanted a volume of an object, that's what an integral is. An integral is the area under a curve. And if it's a two-dimensional shape, like a circle, it would be you know, an integral. Um, so if you, if you had you know, y squared plus x squared equals r squared, which r would be a constant. And, uh, and then you'd have to put that in, you know, take the square root of, uh, you know, get the y equals and then do an integral. And, uh, and you would come up with the same things that the Greeks uh, figured out through different ways, but also the volume. So, uh, you know, people know that the volume of a, of a sphere is a four, um, four r, four r cubed, uh, Four pi r cubed, four pi. Uh, I'm just looking at this. Uh, L's not defined here. Uh, what's L? Yeah, so this one is. Is L a row? Like honestly, um, I'm not sure. So I, honestly, I was just looking for graphics, and so it, it doesn't pay to critique. You know, whatever you know, random. It's not a critique. It's a desire to want to understand what the heck is being written here, and if they don't tell me what L is. There's just some random thing I found on the internet. I okay. searched through a whole bunch, and um, so you didn't actually verify that this made sense. Well, no, it's problematic, but it's, it's difficult finding good material. So I'm, I'm <gasps> okay. going to show something else. But this one had, you know, seven ways to compute the volume of a sphere, and you have in rectangular coordinates, spherical coordinates, cylindrical coordinates, and then a few other um, methods. And you know, um, so. You know, this one, I found another text. I mean, they're all over. This is in every Calculus 3 book or, or something like that, where it said in, uh, um, you know, here you have rectangular and cylindrical coordinates in a sphere. So in cylindrical coordinates, um, you just have radius squared plus Z squared equals C squared, as opposed to spherical coordinates, you have x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals c squared. And if you wanted to compute uh, the volume, you'd have to take an integral. But because it's three-dimensional, it would be a triple integral. And then, I mean, there's also the method people maybe learned in calculus two of rotating an object around the origin. And then, you know, so if people took calculus and had a bunch of problems, if you just had a section of you know, like a, of a cylinder and wanted the area of just a small section, how you'd uh, define the boundaries in order to do that. And I, I, I didn't prepare these problems, um, but just uh, you know, just to show people who took calculus how uh, how these would look. So um, here's an example. And this is just a calculus textbook I found free online. So you know th this would be like what's the volume of a cylinder embedded in a sphere, uh, you know, radius four, and uh, and then you have the radius of the cylinder, and then you have to set up the integral, and you have to you know figure out what the best coordinate system to use. Are you going to use? Um, so in this case, they're using cylindrical coordinates, and then you have to you know, say what's the equation of the object that you're going to be integrating, and then what is the boundaries that you're integrating from. And then to actually compute uh, the integral. So uh, you know, here, here's just the textbook example. I'm not sure if you want to go through and, and do 
the simple example of just uh, proving that uh, through calculus of a triple integral that uh, the area of a sphere is in fact four thirds pi r cubed, or or if uh, you know if you wanted to do that you can. Otherwise, I just you know, kind of showing these are basic things that anyone who's taken university calculus you know, has has uh, done. I haven't prepared to go through that proof, so I don't think it's a good idea. Given that I couldn't even, seeing as I couldn't even derive uh, polar coordinates without making a mistake twice, don't want to try my hand at that. It's such a complicated thing to do on the fly, but uh, yeah, I do want to see you attempt to derive Euler's identity. Look forward to that. Were there any key takeaways from these uh, coordinate systems? Oh, I, I wanted to mention that, like, we're not talking about evaluating something over um, a, a volume over a continuously varying attribute like temperature. We're just at the stage of defining volume in terms of triple integrals. So yeah, I want sort to keep of be it... like integrating a line to make a cube in the standard Cartesian, except we're using a coordinate system that's more natural. We're going in the direction of something of a more natural system. Go ahead. Yeah, if you keep it pretty basic and you know it's kind of like chess if you if you like you have a lot it's, it's chunking theory that we talk about and you know me and jennifer haven't sat down and actually done these problems in years it becomes more difficult and we forget how to do it that years ago like you know i could have just answered a whole bunch of questions one after the next of college calculus people wanting help with their homework and uh, you know how to uh, take triple integrals of shape and then i haven't done in so long I'm not even sure I, I could uh, accurately do a triple integral just of a sphere, um, you know, that, that uh, you know, say is relatively simple. And there was also kind of the part of the stream to, to uh, I've been studying this stuff, and hopefully we're, you know, we can review. It's going to become more mathematically intensive, and, and for our own benefit, uh, you know, we'll actually do some of the stuff so it remains fresh in our head. So... Uh, with that, you know, so me and Jennifer embarrassed ourselves by how much of our basic math we have forgotten by being. I'm not embarrassed because even even when I was really good, I don't think I would have been able to do it live because I would have had to know exactly what the proof was going to be rather than just do it on on the fly. So, but I mean, if, uh, if yeah, I'm definitely a... a little rusty. So it'd be good to catch back up. Yeah, Leonard no, Euler no. looks like uh, you know non plus Wojak there, doesn't he? Yeah, I'm, I'm no comment. Uh, but you know, when when you're in university, generally uh, you teach. So as, if you if you trying to get a PhD, uh, they might have you teach. Uh, you know, freshman undergraduate uh, calculus, and through doing you know the the I just went through the courses. But if you taught you know undergraduate calculus, you TA, you do thousands of these problems. You grade homework. You've seen so many of them. Uh, you know, really, we're not I'm, not. I'm not really here to talk about chunking theory, uh, but it becomes ingrained by doing it, then by teaching it, and uh, checking uh, problems of other people, and just seeing thousands and thousands. So me and Jennifer did relatively well. Good students uh, did a little tutoring. It's not the same as uh, you know someone that uh, maybe got a PhD in mathematics and uh, taught an undergraduate uh, course where they actually had to grade the homework of the students who are trying to do this and, you know, the certain level of, uh, and then, you know, if you're an engineer, what the practicality of what would you be doing in uh, regular life that would actually, um, you know, require you to uh, use something like this on a regular basis. So uh, there's another sphere that th this is going to become important for, um, what I'm trying to advance with uh, kind of like the holographic universe is also the complex plane. So um, Euler's famous formula, which I'm going to show a proof, you know, is the famous uh, uh, has up here. Um, this is Euler's formula, e to the i, here it is, phi or theta equals cosine theta plus i sine theta um, or and uh, if you give it a value e to the i pi equals negative one. So this is the Euler's formula um, where it's a generic formula that is useful for any value. Um, but if you plug in pi, 
the answer is negative one. So I, I will, I've, I've shown some stuff to derive uh, actually a few basic proofs of uh, of this. And uh, but, but one more important thing is the complex coordinate system. So as opposed to having XY coordinate system, you have complex numbers where you'd have your X axis would be your real numbers and your Y axis would be uh, the complex coordinate system. And uh, and there's also a way uh, you say, so say to define it in a, in a circle. And uh, I thought this one had useful graphics. So if you look at, you know, i to the zero power equals one, i to the first power equals i, i squared equals negative one, i cubed equals negative i, i to the fourth equals one. And so... Yeah, you have something that repeats itself every four iterations. Yeah, so if you see on a circular uh, plane like that, that it will become circular. So you have... Uh, you know, this is when we get to Riemann sphere, this is a uh, Riemann sphere is uh, defined in the complex uh, plane. And you see it's E uh, becomes circular uh, because of the nature that uh, you know, I, uh, I to the zero equaling one, putting you here, I to uh, I squared, uh, I to the I to the one, bringing you to the top is for I squared. It, giving you negative one and uh, in being uh, circular and uh, let me let me show these slides here that I, I found so you know basic Euler you see his years um, he actually is in disagreement and a lot of his theories were against um, Leibniz monology so me, me and Jennifer for the last few months have been talking a lot about Leibniz and monology and uh, I mentioned, uh, uh, you know, the formulation of calculus for how it is in our modern times is, is the work of quite a few different people. Um, but I think Euler was a dualist. So, a lot, you know, so it's interesting, you know, to think about that uh, in terms you know, of uh, the, the, these were spiritual religious people. And they had, you know, at that point, engineering was not that well developed. And calculus was more within religious studies was more to describe spiritual phenomenon. And uh, you know, so we will be returning to this, but Euler uh, you know, is uh, slightly after Leibniz. They were alive, I think at the same time for quite a bit of time. Uh, he's in uh, Basel, Switzerland. He studied under Bernoulli, who were also great mathematicians, advancers of uh, calculus. And uh, you could see famous that Euler um, in his terms of advancing for what everybody basically who studies math does today, that uh, using the Greek pi for pi, uh, using i for the square root of negative one, uh, delta for change, like delta y, um, it, you know, Leibniz had the dx dy, uh, but using the delta signal symbol for change, and the definition of a function where you have f of x as a function, and the the Greek. It's probably uh, worth mentioning that this guy was born some thirty plus years after calculus was first uh, defined by two people, right? At least, just wanted to make that clear historically. Yeah. So, so I mean, calc like like religion, uh, you know, calculus becomes canonized, and uh, I think it was I forget the name even who I mentioned a week in review the other day, who uh, you know much later than Euler canonizes kind of the function, the, the form till today. But a lot of the things that's still in use today was canonized from a Euler. So I mean, so he didn't come up with the ideas. What are uh, you I mean, thinking came... about? Um, canonized post Euler? Yeah, I, I shared, I read a book on Week in Review. And, and Albert mentioned... Lorenz, one of, the, one of them, or like a man um, of or who, who I'm just drawing a blank. So I'm thinking the mathematical grades were before this time, weren't they? Well, I mean, the, the calculus, the canonization of the calculus symbols that we use today in the generic understanding of a function. And as said, the, the, the I'll do a quick, uh, the, the creator of the fundamental 
theory of calculus in the name uh, that the that the derivative the, the integral and the, the derivative are are defined as opposites and that wasn't the original um, understanding of, of it uh, you know in terms of <laughs> well of course not uh, I mean it's not uh, it's more accurate to say inverse operators we want to stay away from words like opposite they're not specific enough in math that doesn't even well doesn't define as many negations as it could but still quite a lot more than just one possible negation um yeah so so what how what exactly these things mean and uh what is that? His name you're probably is... thinking of fourier fourier did come after him 1768 to 1830 were you thinking of fourier maybe gauss no no i forget the it's not the name uh uh, basically, the idea that a, a, a derivative as a anti a, an integral is an antiderivative. Oh, yeah, that's a bit later, isn't it? I mean, it seems so obvious now, but uh, definitely at the time, they didn't fully understand what they were looking at. There's about the divergence, and you know, so it's kind of a um, public study session here. If uh, you know, say so we're not math teachers, and wow. uh, we're not officially uh, so it's, it's going to be too long for me to come out with a name. I said it on Week in Review uh, the the other day, but uh, you know, just the different way of defining uh, these these objects and uh, what these ideas or the canonization of the ideas and then you know there's dispute in the canonization of uh these ideas and uh um how we how we understand it today or the different purposes that uh, the people who designed these if newton's main purpose of the calculus was to describe the relationship between uh physics of uh position and uh, velocity and acceleration as opposed to uh, Leibniz which who was more trying to talk about the relationship between the spiritual and material realm to uh, some sort of canonization of a mathematical structure that is useful to uh, you know anybody in, in terms of more computation and uh, solving answers and just the question of what is an integral and in, in what's the purpose of the integrals? The purpose of the integral to calculate um, area, or is the purpose of the integral to show the relationship between um, position, velocity, and acceleration? Or is the purpose of the integral to uh, you know to answer the Epicurean trilemma of uh, of how evil happens? And uh, you know, they're they're all similar. That they're all fundamentally doing the same thing although there are, are certain elements and then if you learn modern calculus today you have the fundamental theorem of calculus and uh, for some reason the name i was thinking is not does, I, I can't even seem to find it so let's just uh, move on it's the purpose of these streams is say that uh, we're trying to talk to people and share these ideas and uh, if and anyone I, in the audience knows who duvet has no clue who he's referring to and i have no clue who it is either and I put about five names out there. I do have a quick description of um, what the integral is that I could present at any time. Okay, good. So I'll, if you want to share your screen, I'll, I'll I'll share you so I could find this find this name. Sweet, perfect timing. Yeah. So these are my notes from when I was a professional tutor. Yes, that's right. People used to pay me good money to teach this stuff a lot so yeah no big deal um indefinite integrals deal with infinity blah 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 blah. that's where it gets into the metaphysical stuff 
to what extent is this infinity on the axis representative of anything? Answer, fuck all. Comment, doesn't matter. Uh, secondary comment, why? Because math's cool and nobody cares if it's worth anything because it's worth enough, even if it's not objectively true. So let's just stop crying. Uh, definite integral. You're looking at uh, question, which is what is the area in this case, a simplified two-dimensional version, which can then once understood be extrapolated to arbitrary dimension hypothetically. Uh, so we're wondering what the area is, and we have a axis at the bottom and a function at the top. So what we're going to do is divide up chunk this area into equally sized quadrilaterals that aren't rectangles quite, but because they are going to have different, slightly different y values. And so long as f is differentiable, you can determine this area exactly. So that's the real power of integral calculus. So just like uh, well, we did, we didn't go through derivative calculus, but basically you'd be looking at a limit of a slope of a tangent at a point of a function. So this is why they didn't know they were inverse operators right away. So integrals answering the question given this setup: a bounding line and a bounding curve, and two bounding points which are extrapolated to lines to match the curve. What is the area? This is the actually opposite operation as what is the instantaneous slope of the tangent at a given point. Don't ask me how, it's just one of those miracles. Moving on. And we had this correspondence between how you start off your map as a finite number of delta x's. And remember that's this right here and the x-axis, a tiny delta x I've got. This is actually a terrible diagram now that I look at it. <laughs> It seems like I was not super careful in making this, but I guess uh, here we have the integral on the left-hand side, which is your limit form versus your non-limit form on the right. So you would start with the Riemann sum on the right, and then when you take the limit of the Riemann sum, you get to the integral. And I have some very... Okay, Duvid's already lost interest, you can see. Uh, we have some various examples here. And choose right hand endpoints, left hand endpoints, test city. This is just against sign conventions. So, this is not probably super interesting to people, but it is sort of fun. I just find math groups sort of fun just for their own, just for the heck of it. Probably in a minority on that. Uh, another thing we haven't got to yet. Oh, David, are you back? You ready to keep going? Because I, I, I'm done with what I was saying. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, we're not, I'm not doing a history of calculus lecture, so I, I have to go through my library to you know try to remember all these names, which you know, is important, but but too, too far off topic. So you know, I mean, the purpose. Of <laughs> I'm sure it'll come to you on the bus. That's what my uncle always says. It was more of the circle, and, and it's important. So that you know, quoting your sources, and, and it's somewhat of a. You know, chunking uh, knowledge of mastery. Someone said Koshi in the uh, chat. Koshi is one of the big names, but he's not the name I'm uh, I'm looking for. I mean, like actually, the I'm, I'm going to be talking about couch the couch the Cauchy Riemann um, hypothesis that the Riemann sphere is uh, you know, actually the formula is called the Cauchy Riemann. Um, I think I was doing a thing the other day and it was saying like CR surfaces and those that, that was couchy Riemann surfaces but that's not the name I'm looking for it's more in terms of the canonization and more not necessarily someone who came up with a theorem uh, but uh, who canonized uh, the language that we use to express these ideas that you know say so when you take calculus in school you have all these symbols and methods for doing it and it was canonized so just uh, you know, got off veered because I was mentioning, you know, at least the slides here that, uh, you know, whoever made these slides, uh, you know, might even not be that accurate. Uh, but Euler is generally credited with the f of x uh, for the definition of a function. And 
Okay, so just mention Euler wrote more than 500 books and papers during his lifetime um, that uh, his collected works fill 73 large volumes, tens of thousands of uh, pages with more volumes still coming out from records of stuff that Euler uh, wrote. Uh, Euler is probably the single most common name in uh, in mathematics. And I think, you know, the E, I think, is refers to Euler, actually, when we say the E. It does. It does indeed. Yeah, it's very special discovery, that. Yeah, although the idea of E uh, possibly predated. So here it just has, um, you know, what I was talking earlier, the representation of complex numbers on, on a graph. Uh, so you say if real numbers are, you know, line versus complex numbers. Uh, this one actually is, we might talk about this a different time, but uh, quarter, uh, quor, uh, quaternions and octonions. I think it's are, quaternion. Yeah, this actually is somewhat related, I think, to quantum physics, this stuff, but it's not, not uh, for today. Um, but the E... Um, has many unique properties. Usually the definition of E is, uh, is, uh, could just be defined as one plus, uh, one, usually just one divided by N to the nth. Here you have it in complex notation with a pi, uh, but E, um, if you, one plus one divided by N to the nth, uh, will give you the value of E. And if you take it to, uh, any, any level, you know, E is, a uh, um, a transcendental number and you know so just connecting it this is going to be just a graphic of the proof of euler's famous uh, formula so just thinking here's like an anima animation depicting uh, uh this is what i was talking alluding to before about the tra um not sure what you call it a uh, isomorphism from the unit sphere under infinite rotation to the full x-axis for a regular a sinusoidal signal like greeny and bluey there. Yeah, so as something that would be infinite moving on the x-plane in a complex uh, notation could just be seen as traversing around the circle again and again. So here's somewhat of a graphic of uh, this Euler's equation, e to the i pi, e i x, or theta, some of different symbols equals cosine x plus i sine x of uh, some way to try to uh, visualize it. This is Euler's formula. And I said if uh, x equals pi, then you have the negative one, which we'll see the various, uh, I think here, um, So here you just, you know, simple example, if you see that, uh, you know, zero. So here you have Euler's identity and, you know, the famous equation of e to the i pi equals negative one. Graphics. I'll, I'll put this uh, in the chat, and, and I guess hyperbolic uh, functions. I'm sorry, I'm producing a low quality stream. I apologize, but I, I just put it out there because uh, you know we need the uh, you know a lot of research. I just put it out there. So this is a Taylor expansion. Uh, so one way to prove th there's multiple methods to prove Euler's formula. So one is the Taylor expansion. And uh, it's an advanced mathematical method. Sometimes you learn Taylor, uh, Taylor series even in pre-calculus, but uh, you could use an expansion method to define functions. So example, cosine x uh, is you know, this expansion of one minus x squared uh, divided by uh, two, um, I forget what the explanation point, the, the how that's factorial uh, factorial plus and then it goes you know plus x to the fourth four factorial minus x to the sixth uh, factorial going up by twos the power divided by the factorial plus and minus as where sine is opposite starting with x uh and 
3 minus plus to the third. And then you have e to the x um, is 1 plus x plus x squared divided by 2 factorial plus x cubed divided by 3 factorials. And there's proof, we go more to Taylor series, how these are derivatives. So one example of, uh, did you want to mention any about Taylor series and the origins of these um, expansions? Other things to look at that are also relevant to this topic are Maclaurin series and epsilon delta. That's a type of proof for a series convergence, which does end up being pretty important because you want an intuition for intervals over which series converge. Not just whether they converge, but out of the set of all possible models, which converges the fastest, right? So that's where we're get on my level type thing that's where we're sort of taking these problems eventually so taylor series mclaurin series which is a special case as a taylor series epsilon delta proofs as well as other varietals of proofs but those would be your your most important heavy duty interrelational ones that easily lend themselves to the hyperbolic geometry that's more or less necessitated for an accurate depiction of causality we may even need to come in and change it again if it, it may not be entangled enough, right? Because these models are ultimately failing, not to get off on a rant here, because space time's not being modeled in the proper degree of entanglement. That's all. Thank you. Yes, I mean, kind of why I wanted to do the stream. I want to encourage Jennifer to do streams like this on her channel. Uh, maybe I'll join her occasionally, other people, uh, and, and for week interview that will be more technically correct and refresh yourself, and uh, you'll be able to. Uh, um, you use some of these things to to express the ideas we're talking about in, in so to say mathematically correct way that uh, you people of classical university education would say that corresponds to you know how they were taught or how they understand things but uh, you know, if uh, just seeing that the you, there is a method to expand functions to define functions in terms of expansions and four year series is uh, similar also in that uh venue and you know, so if you just Dude, see we lost you for a second i think i'm not sure okay will you hear me yeah you're good now it's just for a quick second okay so if you see here um if you look at the equation e to the i x equals cosine of x plus i sine of x that if you look at the uh Taylor and McLaurin expansion that it corresponds with the expansion. So we had, you know, here that e to the x equals 1 plus x plus x squared divided by 2 factorial sine of the x, x. Uh, yeah, the, the principle of indistinguishable. Two sets are equivalent if and only if all their elements are in common, right? That's what the, this is a proof of a, a standard equivalence proof. Yeah, and we'll talk more in week in review and other things on, on the philosophy of mathematics. Like, what is a proof? What does it mean to be true uh, or, or equivalent? If uh, you know, being equivalent, uh, what what that means. But uh, you see that the expansions of uh, the equivalent. So, if you have e to the i x equals cosine x plus i sine x, and then you look at the expansions, so you have cosine x, and if you multiply i times sine x, so in the expansion, i would be in all the elements. <laughs> and then you add those together, you add cosine x and i sine x, you get, um, you know, th this uh, this here, the 1 plus i x minus x squared uh, divided by 2 factorial, um, I'm not sure if they make minus i to the x cubed. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I guess it, you get minus, minus, plus, plus, minus, minus. Um, and then if you look uh, because of the nature of the i being squared um and and then if you compare that to e to the x and you say e to the i x is one plus i x divided by one factorial plus i x squared and uh and you see the nature of the signs will uh, be the same because i squared is going to be negative one and yeah so just see... just to be clear like if if someone wanted to present this as an actual proof can you go to the next slide for a sec yeah that one that one uh no wait hang on can you go to the one after 
can you go back to sorry i must have been in the wrong direction uh, i just want to just this one here you would never write a proof like this you would not write that you would write demonstrate that e to the i x is da, 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 and then you say uh let cos and then let this and then let and then you'd say i'm going to add them together now and then you'd show how the thing added together had all the same elements as the e to the i x based on some existing definition and then you'd conclude e to the i x that this way of writing it looks a lot like they're presupposing the premise so yeah this is actually not a great proof because it doesn't really prove that these Maclaurin series converge, which is a non-trivial thing to establish an interval of convergence. But that's sort of a different question. But yeah, it's you can basically use that like a two dollar whore in any math and it's all good. Yeah, I mean it's something that's true, like a Pythagorean theorem I showed like you know 30 different proofs of it. There's multiple different ways of demonstrating it. Uh, you know, say that uh, it's true because it works and there, you haven't found a case where it doesn't uh, work and you just try plugging in values and you see that it holds you just uh, well whether it's it. true depends on whether you know the mclaurin series is true and it's true from the perspective of epsilon delta so i brought that up before which is yeah. just as true as any limit function because i think you can derive calculus from epsilon delta but don't quote me on that it's been a while since i've looked over that stuff Right, too, too too philosophical into what is proof, what is proof, what is true, um, but just saying these are the type proofs or equivalents that uh, you know, like I saw this in I think calculus three in you know, multiple times. You know, professors even earlier, maybe even high school people had put this uh, you know just to show it. Or there's hundreds of videos on YouTube, and I, I have another proof here. I think also on on this, and uh, you know, so here just plugging in pi. Uh, that uh, you're saying if, if you uh, e to the i pi um, equaling negative one, which uh, because cosine of pi is negative one and sine of pi is zero, and then e to the i pi is also negative one, and uh, and then you're even looking at uh, the geometric and then say, why is e to the i pi negative one? But saying it's linking the five most important constants in mathematics. Zero, the additive identity. You add it to any number, it leaves the number unchanged. One is the multipl uh, multiplicative identity. Multiple identity, one times any number, leaves the number unchanged. E is the exponential function, uh, which we defined before in the base of natural logarithms and also the integral derivative identity that e to the x is its own integral or derivative the integral of e to the x is e to the x the derivative of e to the x is e to the x and then pi uh, the ratio of the circle circumference to its diameter and i the square root of negative one richard feynman credible famous physicist claim this was the jewel of mathematics. Some have written that because of the innate beauty and simplicity of this equation, that Euler used it as proof that God must exist. And people who call this God's equation probably haven't actually read Euler and Leibniz because that was my point about dualism, is that uh, Leibniz was a monist, but uh, you know, largely from uh, you could understand him classically as a dualist or Euler as a dualist that the equation wasn't God's equation. The equations were meant to show the correspondence of, so to say, uh, the spiritual and physical realms or mind and matter, that uh, that was more what um, Like a divine simplicity type of uh, ordering principle thing? Well, they're saying that, the, like I showed on Week in Review in my, my diagram, that the mathematics is a higher order rule that coordinates the spiritual and physical realms so that calculus and, and integrals and derivatives were from the mind of Euler and Leibniz meant to show how uh, the spiritual and physical realms coordinate with each other like uh, um, Ben Watkins would talk about the interaction problem 
uh, that, uh, you know, how does the soul interact with the body? And so Leibniz and Euler thought that calculus was the answer to the interaction problem and how the spiritual and material realms interact. Interact. So fine men or modern day people, oh, you know, look how these things all co correspond. There must be a God who created the universe. That wasn't what they meant by the God equation. They meant that they were that they were hoping when they developed these equations that these equations would accurately describe the workings of the physical and material realms. Hmm. And here right. you have, um, and, and so I mean, these days, like we read about Euler and Leibniz. Anybody who studied mathematics knows the names. But very few people actually read Euler and Leibniz. More people read Newton because Newton's more relevant today in physics. Uh, like Principica is much more read than, than Leibniz. But, uh, you know, Euler and, uh, and uh, Leibniz were more what we'd call mystics than engineers. Like, uh, you know, Newton is more relevant today to modern academia because he was more an engineer, although he was also a mystic. Anyone who's actually read Newton's literature, that event uh Euler and Leibniz actual work on calculus is more mystical than engineering. And here we have a bunch of identities and uh you know so the relationship of uh different identities. So uh I think maybe this one had another proof like you could use a hyperbolic function or i think you could prove or if you use the word prove um euler euler's uh formula um without taylor series so uh I was just thinking of sketching it out. I mean, this probably won't work because my intuitions on these things are usually terrible. But I was thinking derive I from the eigenvectors of a rotation matrix with particularly selected values somehow might do it. But that might end up with a, quote, truth explosion, a.k.a. too many variables. But, but you were probably actually taught that in school like you may not remember uh but you know so say a proof without taylor series you probably in class your professor probably showed you, you probably um looked looked it up so you know just looking online there's hundreds of these videos you can see this one's got over a hundred thousand views of uh, a proof uh, without taylor series and then you have like you know like a you know set of a formal let um let f of phi equal e to the i phi times cosine theta i then then take uh, the derivative then permutate it a few times and uh so i, I didn't prepare this um I, i'm sure jennifer has seen these proofs before and there's actually more than one you could look online and said there's multiple proofs of that Euler's. proof looked like it was going in an extremely weird direction but i said there, there's hundreds of these online and it says you know, one usually known as the most famous uh, formula in um, calculus, and and so you can we've had low viewership, a low quality stream. Um, you know, for this, it's, it's I guess more for me and Jennifer to get on the same page and stuff. More to come for us to uh, you know get more used to talking uh, in technically correct mathematical um, terminology. I took and, a picture and rendered it into hyperbolic geometry. I don't know if you can see it, but it's very small. You're but. not sharing it? Or are you saying that's your profile picture? Yeah, my profile. I can show another one. I found an awesome website. I can share it. It can generate hyperbolic images. Really cute. Okay, so I had two more things I wanted to cover. And I probably this is kind of like a low-quality stream, get low viewership. But uh, you know, hopefully it's going to be a sign of more to come and hopefully get week in review more back on track and more you know, academically uh, rigorous. So another concept is, um, I, I guess, parameter, parametrization and mapping. And uh, you know, just the concept of having an object and 
mapping it to another and uh so i guess there's a lot of slides here that just a few of them were useful for wanting to show so i guess you have isometric mapping that preserves length conformal mapping um preserves angles and you have equal real um preserving area and so you know you think of maps generally and how you have, if you have a spherical map and you want to map it onto two dimensions that you you're going to lose some of the information um and how you choose to map it uh you know if you want to preserve so to say the angles or if you want to preserve the lengths uh it will come out in a different way and uh mathematical uh method of uh, of analysis and topology and in, in, in uh um there's mathematical methods that are used to map and convert one equation to another in the same way that you could convert and not lose any information convert between the different coordinate systems because the different coordinate systems are really the just uh, different ways of saying the same thing and i showed earlier the conversion factors of converting uh different uh, something to different uh, one coordinate system to the other and converting from the xy plane x xyz to uh spherical coordinates where we had where uh you know x equaling uh rho times uh, sine sine phi cosine phi or i have to check uh, you have to you know that's some of the purpose of the stream to refresh our memories so um, one of these famous mathing map methods is the Cauchy Riemann um, surfaces. And uh, so it's, it's mathematical and it's based on, uh, you know, somewhat like a parametrization where you have a UV and uh, you define an equation in term of a different set of equations. A lot of times they use U and V for this and, and then sometimes U and V will equal You're T. You're talking about integration by parts? Because you've lost me a bit with your. Well, the Cauchy there. Riemann involves integration by part, but it's a mapping method. Okay. The, the purpose of it is to map x, y to a uv plane. Okay, gotcha. And and the and the Cauchy Riemann method of of mapping uh, relates the partial derivative of u. Uh, of, of you, you can see the relation here, and I didn't prepare to go in depth in depth on it. And I just uh, give some of the definitions. You have a harmonic map. Um, and, and there's a whole bunch of uh, different theories on different ways to uh, to map. And there's matrix map mapping. And it's just really if you're defining an equation. So you say an equation is a shape. So any equation, you can say really an equation is a geometric shape if you plotted it out. And then you could take that plot and say there's a different method to get the shape and uh you know so this is somewhat called a mapping and it's really one of the most complex things that exists in all of uh um mathematics and uh you know the pinnacle which i wanted to at least mention tonight is the riemann sphere which is uh, an extended complex plane that uh, is a method really for creating any shape based on a sphere in a complex plane but it has a uh, infinity and uh, um, so you have what's called the stereographic projection does that sound familiar to you yes it does it's when you take a sphere and a line through the bottom of the sphere, through the top of the middle, and then for every point on the sphere, you extend that to the plane at the bottom of the sphere. So that map is uh, one to one for all but one point. And did you want to guess which point that was? Um, well, the apex, the, the top exactly. point. Exactly. Because we can't isolate a point on, because it's essentially infinity on your uh, XY. Yeah, and so it's it's um, a possible way of mapping. 
So you could say any two dimension, any any thing on the two dimensional plane could be seen as just a series. Of, they were talking about parametrization and time, but uh, just a series of lines being projected off of a sphere. And so it's a different way of defining a shape. So if you had like, you know, like a two dimensional shape and you could define it. Now you're uh, thinking of unfolding as a S2 into uh, R2. That's the way to think of this projection. So uh, you're starting with S2 and you're ending with R2 and all but your apex are basically one to one. And why is this important? Well, because I is intimately connected with rotation. And what's important about rotation? Well, measurement limit. There's only three independent rotations for the same reason as only three independent directions. Back to you, Dubit. Yeah, so in complex, like, uh, higher level math, like, it's you say it's, you know, these complicated notations and just pages of equations. And these equations could represent shapes and they could be transferred from one to the other. And, uh, like, when you're talking about simple calculus and trying to uh, find areas of shapes or define shapes, you have to choose the best coordinate system to work with it in. And uh, that coordinate system, um, you know, could be cylindrical, spherical, or Cartesian. And, uh, and, and then you might convert it from one to the other to do certain permutations. If you could have the same equation and you want to do something with it, you're going to convert it to polar coordinates, and then you might convert it back to Cartesian for other calculations, that the same could be applied in more complex ways than that. And, and then you, know, you could even consider this like non-Euclidean geometries, and then you could have non-Euclidean geometries that define Euclidean geometries. And here's another famous one. When the, you, the, you use this one, you just replace the parallel lines axiom with the hyperbolic axiom or the hyperbolic equivalent yeah so here we have uh, a mobius do you know what i'm talking about the uh, hyperbolic equivalent or where are we going to get to that later um well i'm near the end of the basic things i want to cover okay and so you know this was kind of a. Uh, um in fact that's all of uh, all of my slides all of my all of the stuff i prepared so, uh, you know, I mean, it says we can't have a comprehensive review. We're not going to do in two hours, uh, you know, math, uh, cover, uh, you know, year, what takes years in university. But uh, I just wanted to uh, put in line, um, you know, one thing that, you know, hopefully we can review or talk, that we'll talk about what did the people who came up with these theories believe, and especially when we talk about dualism and spiritual subjects and trying to talk about spiritual subjects in mathematical terms and uh and actually maybe you know i'll be on my channel looking at some of the texts of uh you know we can review been talking a lot about leibniz uh but uh if, you know from that that's more the direction i'm moving in and and also uh, for multiple truth hypothesis for physics if you want to talk about uh the holographic universe or multiple truth hypothesis then the, the question of what is reality, what is truth, and then you look, well, mathematics isn't necessarily so clear that uh, you say, okay, what is a sphere? Is a sphere the physical object, or is the sphere the equation for the sphere? And then you say that there's multiple different ways to uh, describe the sphere, and uh, you know, may, maybe they all could be uh, um, permutated, they all could be uh, equivalent to each other, uh, but uh, you know, so that's part of the direction, my angle in uh, developing this. And also you're just moving forward to, you know, be sharper and be able to connect it to more real world uh, applications. I think next week or two weeks from now might be the automotive testing expo. Um, I might go in real life uh, to the expo, you know, talking to engineers about automotive equipment and stuff like this, um, like, you know, like Elon Musk uh, sending uh you know, spaceship William Shatner went to space today. And, uh, you know, so just being able to show quick calculations uh, for real world applications, engineering applications, computer applications, information theory, and then also spiritual topics, and then also ontological, epistemological uh, ideas to put them in more 
mathematical form and the uh, you know because we've been talking about monism for so long and uh you know the platonic uh uh platonism where where plato you know largely looks at the sphere as the origin of the material realm and the solids as the origins of uh, earth uh air fire water and ether and those are all permutations of the sphere and uh you know even the hyperbolic figure eight and uh, maybe you know we'll look more into thad roberts uh, research and possibly how these uh um constants of the physical world could be derived from a circle you know from the hyperbolic figure eight which is kind of like the collapse of a circle and uh you know so it's interesting so i want to start with the you know the unit circle and the sphere and give you know a little preview on uh, you know some of the stuff that hopefully you know, I'm reading and studying this stuff constantly and hopefully uh, you know me and Jennifer will be able to uh, you know sharpen up so that we could speak about this stuff in correct terminology uh, you know know the names better offhand you know through chunking uh, repetition study review and uh, and then even be more mathematical where we could express our ideas and you know whip out a whiteboard and uh, you know, have some diagrams and equations that uh, make sense to uh, you know even people that may not uh, agree with our uh, metaphysics or, or what we're trying to say but uh, it could at least uh, you know so that was kind of my idea for the stream I thought week in review was maybe getting a little off of what I wanted because uh, um, you know it's kind of like debate and personalities and and, and uh, you know so I wanted to get more back to the research and more grounded in something that is uh, you know, someone could recognize someone who has education, someone who studied, someone who's, uh, you know, sort of say the accepted wise men of the Western tradition, the terminology that that uh, they use that uh, could uh, somewhat bring it back, uh, you know, to to uh, to that. Okay, cool. Well said. Yeah, my final bit would be just to say that, like, uh, we're we're undertaking quite a as Jangle Stick says, hefty topic. So I appreciate everything we can do that will center our intention towards the gigantic uh, task ahead of us. But I think we can proceed forward and framing it as for all arguments, there exist axioms for all, which I've said before, like for all information, positive assertions, it's more general there's axioms for that too right like even very basic language axiom all right so what we want to do is look for what those uh axioms or presuppositions are some of them are less you not just the presuppositions but the the deciding factor presupposition in the argument not all axioms have the same uh, degree not all axioms can deduce the same degree of, of information or more specifically uh desirable information math gives you one example or actually now we, we probably have maybe two examples now with that thing where you can implement axioms to excise particular information, domain specific information. And what could we argue to be like completely sort of, I don't want to say perpendicular way, but for all intents and purposes, perpendicular in, in some sense, perpendicular in the sense of one might think of alternative unit. <laughs> what is it? Multiverse? <laughs> Are you not at all? Uh, ultimately, we want to deduce a priori, get practice deducing things a priori from axioms, and then sort of hone in on the axioms that are as few axioms as possible to basically deduce everything, and then return to the necessity of coherent metaphysics. Certain things you can't prove, but you can demonstrate them, which is a proof of concept, because in some sense they, do, they require like not an infinite number of data, but access to an infinity. So... And for communication axioms, theory. But we can demonstrate their validity. And it's important to see through experience. Sorry, I just want to finish real quick. Like, why these things are important. So how axioms frame questions not self-evident. And it could be a lot more powerful way to make arguments. And a math would be a stepping stone towards that. But not an end in and of itself. Because the axioms of math versus the way to structure arguments 
to win them IRL, like the ones IRL would be structured based on the laws of physics, not the laws of math, which is an intermediary, but it nevertheless necess necessary intermediary in a lot of cases just to build up those basic skills required for more complex things like debate. Thanks for listening. Just to sort of put a bow on what you said earlier. See, in my head, it all ties together to being relevant, but it do but doesn't see how it's all <laughs> relating to essentially the same thing. So there's always, you know, I do think we're doing quite well, even though we've had some flubs, just, just to say like, Overall, well, so for communication theory to be able to express things in the way that people are most likely to know it and say, okay, you might have your problems, uh, you know, we have our problems with uh, the way things are presented in you know, university or canonized, uh, but to say that uh, we're talking about ideas, most of what we're saying that people are familiar with and to put in the terminology that people are already familiar with large parts of these ideas, so a certain precision a certain understanding of the lexicon. I was watching, you know, these mathematical uh, videos. I'll share on Week in Review of you know this uh, this man. Uh, um, I'm trying to check his name, uh, Wildberger, with you know his own. But uh, you know, say what is it? What is the lexicon that uh, is used in the university system, and where does my ideas differ from the main? stream in, in order to express it and and then uh you know i, I was just watching a video earlier today about uh ram Khal, the Rav moshe lazado who who uh the famous book masila sashar on the path of the just and the nature of people who talk about mystical ideas is people generally think it's like weak-minded people that believe in spiritual stuff and uh you know so if, if people are talking about spiritual stuff generally people think it's because they're dumb and uh so, you know, to be able to work against that uh, typical grain that is saying, like, no, me and Jennifer have uh, good educations from top schools and understand, you know, like uh, Joanne or something, like, it's not that I don't, you don't understand evolution, why I reject it. I understand evolution and I still reject it. I don't need you to just explain to me the basic evolution in order to correct my understanding. Um, you know, I went to good schools. <laughs> I understand yeah. what they taught me. Uh, but I see it differently anyways. Yeah. And, you know, Jennifer's, you know, more, I don't know, call it combative approach. You're just like, well, I'm right. Um, you know, saying that like a communication theory for what is the idea in my head or her head and how are you? To me, it's cruel to lie to people with a lower level of intelligence. But um, I'll work on being more diplomatic. I appreciate the feedback. Yeah. And just say, because I, I guess the text that I've read, you said like, no, I mean, the assumption is the person with a spiritual idea is people are going to assume that me and Jennifer are the one with the lower level of intelligence. That, uh, you know, even if it's correct to say actually it's me and Jennifer that are at the higher level of intelligence, that the assumption is going to be the opposite. And then to express things in the terminology, so like, no, I went to good schools, I know what you're talking about, uh, and, and could express it in that uh, terminology also, and saying there is something else, a better understanding. And, uh, you know, this is what you were taught. Uh, this is the idea that. Uh, you know, so that, that was one of the purpose of these streams. So rather just having these ideas in our heads that maybe no one else is going to understand, you know, communication theory to being able to express these ideas in, you know, say the way that it would be expressed in the academy, at least from, uh, you know, my perspective, uh, you know, Jennifer could uh, do as she pleases, but it's been largely my, uh, you know, consistent advice that I would call like the scientific method, but the basis of, uh, academic publication where you have to do historical review and you have to basically go over what historically the great minds of previous generations thought about the idea and where our thoughts on the idea come into that. And even if you're talking about spiritual realms and, uh, you know, sort of say my mind understanding things because some sort of connection uh, between uh, a divine realm uh, that, uh, would largely be rejected in the academic realm, but at least being able to describe it in the terms and even be able to show that that uh, is actually how, uh, you know, the fathers of the West, so to say, the fathers of uh, of modern uh, Western society themselves defined it. And, uh, you know, so going to I mean, to who the, can argue against a quantum periodic table? Well, I, people just aren't listening or not going to care. Whether, whether you might have an idea, you might be correct, uh, but, uh, you know, whether people are going to understand the idea that's in your head and and then say if you want to spread your idea it's upon you 
to uh, express the idea in a way that other people are um, going to understand. And you could use possibly examples like uh, um, Tesla or something that maybe he had correct understandings but wasn't correct. It wasn't able to convey it to other people in a way, and then it was other people who developed the ideas, and maybe 100 years later, it's like, no, Tesla actually understood that idea uh, back then correctly. He just uh, you know, didn't have the personality to uh, explain to anybody else and uh, or you know ver various things. Um, so that's at least uh, my angle on it, my approach, and why, why I wanted to do this stream. And I don't want to waste a bunch of time arguing with Jennifer and saying like uh, whether she has an idea and it's correct in her head. Um, you know, say whether whether uh, I, I wouldn't expect anyone to have faith in her that, and, and say that uh, that that's true. Maybe it is true. You know, saying work before I think she has ideas. Maybe they're correct. But to have faith that uh, that the idea in her head is correct, uh, that that no, it's upon her to express it in a way that other people understand. And if you she could be agnostic, and, and if she, uh, well, yeah, that doesn't preclude you from using things that well, I might be agnostic on it. But with. I would say that no, in your average person. We'll I'm talking just about no. yourself, though. Now, now, the average person cannot judge the truth value of what I'm saying. We both know that. Well, I said not to say that their value uh, means something, but said so like, uh, that, I mean, as I mentioned, Miss Silas that uh, that at least from the sages I learned, learned so that, that not even the average person, the majority of people, even the sages, are going to lean towards no, are going to lean towards saying this person's probably dumb, not smart, and uh, you know, so the the assumption is. That you know, Jennifer might be right, uh, but uh, no one's going to care. No one's going to go to the effort of trying to show that she's right. She's going to one who's going to have to go through that effort, and uh, you know that's the price of trying to share these ideas. And uh, and you know that's my understanding of how things work. And uh, well, I mean, if God's a solipsist, wouldn't it just be faster to ascend to divine personhood and then just take over what everybody thinks? since they're just fragments of God mind, right? I mean, if that's true, that'd be the fastest way, wouldn't it? Right, because you're talking about theoretical ontologies that most people don't accept. Logic! <laughs> so you, I mean, you can go back into dualism and the nature of the material realm and the nature of God and say most people are, are going to have generally a materialist understanding and, uh, and they're not even going to... I mean, even, most people are not even going to... Uh, you know, said so that your average person, if someone has spiritual ideas, just assumes they're a fraud, they're a crack. The assumption is they're dumb, not smart. And, uh, and you know, so you could have your own understanding of how things operate and work or, you know, say like one day we'll die, death will set us free and the truth will be revealed and, and we'll know the answer. Uh, but till then, the assumption is uh, that this is how the material realm operates and uh you, you know saying like you know just like any belief system that uh, you know one day you'll die and if you believed in this deity or that deity or this principle or that principle you'll be rewarded or punished accordingly and uh and, and that you'll be generally put in uh you know that type of uh, of system that uh, like whatever you're talking about i don't know um, you know, may, maybe I'm dumb and I don't understand. Maybe you're dumb. And you don't you understand any of it? About. You understand any of it? Even just a tiny little, tiny little thread? Well, I'm talking more the generic uh, um, outlook on expressing in communication theory. Ah, I see. So I said, you know, whether you're right or wrong, you know, just like saying what, whether, you know, when I die, I'm going to heaven or hell or there is a heaven or hell. Uh, you know, so when I die, I'll find out. And uh, but you know, till then, you know, say most people, if you know, say they don't believe in heaven or hell, they don't think anything like that, you know. So, so it's like that, that, you know, that's why I use the expression, your know, death will set me free. And uh, you because really, you're not that uh, at least most of the sages, Kabbalistic sages, different, uh, you're saying that, uh, that uh, as long as the soul is trapped in the body, or from a scientific, the problem of, of empiricism, the problem of knowledge. Uh, that we can't really know the answers to these questions. So, you know, maybe death will set us free one day and we'll know the answers to these questions. But till that point, uh, you know, it's largely shrouded in uncertainty. And uh, most people, sw in case of uncertainty, sway towards no. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I've talked about my chunking theory on how people understand truth. And, 
you have to build truth off of things that you already understand. And if a system is not built upon the principles that a person is already familiar with, then you have a cognitive dissonance that the person has to leave their system. So to say, even if you're right, that uh, you, from my understanding of cognitive dissonance, it doesn't matter uh, that uh, um, a person can't just accept the truth. They have to build the truth off of their axioms. And if their axioms are false, that there has to be some method to relieve the false axioms and still true axioms. And in some cases that could be impossible. And so, okay, death will set me free of my false axioms. Uh, but the dissonance uh, at the point is like, no, my, my ingrained false axioms, that there is no way to see the truth. And uh, you even from a Kabbalistic ontology, that's the nature of the material realm, that uh, taking material form in and of itself prevents us from understanding the truth. And only death will set us free of the material body and enable us to uh, see the truth. Um, but I mean, that's the basic Kabbalistic uh, Judaic understanding that I was trained and understand these things. And I was talking talk about, you know, violence a lot and the human nature of uh, cognitive dissonance and, uh, you know, saying that uh, you can like, like the Jesus principle is say like, no, this is the truth. And uh, I'm going to tell the people the truth and they're going to recognize that what I told them is the truth, but they're going to crucify me for doing it. They're not going to reward me because it's the nature of cognitive dissonance and to have the people, you know, so to say, relieved of their false axioms. Um, it, it's very complicated. Well, and... this is exactly why the knowledge is traditionally kept secret to some degree to protect the bearer of the knowledge from the negative repercussions of the cognitive dissonance, right? Like, it's not really a defense to be like, well, I told you the truth. <laughs> it's like, no, you know more. It's up to you to strategically let that truth, truth out based on meant... principles. It's not so the truth, truth in and of itself is not be... a principle. Because people get so antagonized and upset. Yeah, I mean, to it, some extent, not meant to be revealed. Yeah. That's what, like, uh, you know, the, the Hebrew text that righteous people look forward to their death. Um, if there's a battle in the material realm between evil and good, that evil, you know, so to say, has the home court advantage. So, so to say, the truth is not meant for the material realm. The truth is limited by the material realm. And, uh, it's kind of what I mentioned at the beginning of the nature of the connection between algebra and geometry. So we say algebra is the truth and geometry is an illusion, so to say, saying that, uh, you know, there, there is some sort of metaphysical truth um, and the physical representation of the truth, like a platonic cave, is the illusion and it's an inaccurate uh, uh, manifestation and there is no way to correctly manifest truth in the material realm and uh, you know so that hardcore axiom of possibly the jesus principle uh you know duties of the heart that i went over in my channel and kind of these hardcore religious uh, dualistic principles to say okay righteous people look forward to the death uh, because there is no truth in the material realm and uh, you know so say that even if you had access to the truth there is no way to share it and even from like a messianic possibly you know like the kabbalists say in the end the material you know we're, we're going to revert to the spiritual realm because ultimately the truth is in opposition to uh, material form and uh, and even looking at mathematics could be indicative of this and you say like the great minds like plato uh, leibniz uh, euler looked at mathematics and calculus and even newton in this form uh, you know, Newton, a lifelong celibate, didn't have any children. And uh, a lot of you know, these guys were mostly Christian at, in the period in the West, uh, but uh, you know, saw uh, a disconnect to the material realm and thought about these things in esoteric terms and had to disconnect from the material form just to think about these ideas. And uh, really that's abstract thought. And we're talk about the, you know, the general Platonic uh, proof for the spiritual realm that ideas don't exist in the material realm they exist in the spiritual realm because if you want to think about abstract thought you have to disconnect yourself from the body and the senses because uh, uh the senses uh are, are limiting so uh i'm not sure if you had any thoughts on that but i mentioned at the beginning you know, what uh, that you could 
it's not necessarily some of the great minds of the Western tradition did say straight up that basically um, as a mapping algebra corresponding to the spiritual realm and geometry to the physical realm. Uh, but sometimes it's just intuitive and you say really geometry is also part of the spirit algebra and geometry are actually both part of the spiritual realm. And in uh, and these things I want to express on, uh, on week in review and the nature of uh, abstract thought. I'm not sure exactly which part of that you want me to address. And so Jangle Stick is saying, you know, Duva is talking about connecting mathematics to spiritual matters. I'm saying, no, mathematics is a spiritual matter. So connecting mathematics to material matters, because mathematics is by definition a spiritual science. And that's why I said, when you talk about X and Ys and abstract thoughts, you're already in the spiritual realm. And so if you're ontology, you don't recognize the spiritual realm, or you don't know how to correctly uh, differentiate between mind and matter, that you think that mathematics is an element of the material realm, and I'm using mathematics to talk about spiritual matters, and I'm saying definitionally uh, it's the opposite, and that's the point I'm trying to express, and, uh, and, and I'm trying to bring the proof of these very names of the people who came up with the very ideas that led us to be atheists today um, defined it this way, that uh, you know today we use mathematics and science largely in an atheistic, materialistic world because mathematics and science so correctly define the material realm that people think that mathematics and science is a, a material wisdom when the very people who came up with these wisdoms said it was the opposite. So they're following the edicts of this mathy religion of evolution or something along those lines. Um, well, and that's where you go back to chunking theory. People are just trying to understand the world we live in the best of their ability by recognizing patterns. And people don't understand themselves like Socrates, know thyself, uh, that people, uh, you know, the material realm is very accurate. So you can say there is this. And if I say the me is not this body, um, you would say, well, all I see is this body. You know, what are you talking about? This guy's a madman. Um, but, uh, you know, the fundamental understanding of, uh, you know, the, of the ancients of the developers of math and calculus was that, uh, you know, the me, the Socrates, the Plato, the Leibniz, the Car uh, Descartes, you know, so on and so on, uh, today weren't their bodies and their bodies are now long gone. The carbon cycle, if they were buried, uh, you know, has uh, returned the elements that made up their body and recycled into the earth. But their ideas still live on and say, because they weren't their body, their essential them uh, was, was never their body. And saying the essential me that is now in this body isn't actually uh, this body. And, and it's a fundamental, really, you know, like in, in the U.S., you only see like Hindus or Hare Krishnas really that would say that straight up expression um, you know, the Hare Krishnas are, are really the only people I ever hear talk like that and say, I'm not my body. Um, but most Hindus or Hasidic Jews, um, people who've studied uh, Jewish mysticism uh, or, or even Christians would accept the basic premise that I am not my body. I am something that controls uh, and, and has the sense perception of my body, but the essential I that is thinking and talking with uh, you right now is not the body. The body is just being used to communicate whatever the essential me is in uh, the material realm, in the essential you that, uh, you know, hears these sound waves and transforms that into uh, intelligible ideas is not your body either. So I, I mean, most, you know, I've done a lot of interfaith and, and basically everyone from most spiritual traditions that believe in a soul, uh, you know, by definition, if I, I just talked with Ben Watkins today, so whatever reason, we didn't have our debate last week. Uh, but if it comes on uh, next week about the nature of a soul will be, um, you know, that no, that I am not my body. And even if, you know, Ben Watkins is a materialist or T-Jump is an atheist and says, I am my body, I am a product of my brain, say he's just making a fundamental mistake 
and even though he perceives himself to be his body and and uh, the uh, you know T jump that you spoke to as a product of his body that he is incorrect and the T jump you spoke to was not in fact his body and was in fact his soul and uh, you know will survive his death and so on and so on but whatever reason the element of him that put these patterns together and incorrectly perceive these patterns in an incorrect way and, uh, and and then you know the cognitive dissonance of a person who has a, a lifetime of incorrect perceptions uh you know which is somewhat related to the expression death will set us free uh which, which because of all these incorrect perceptions that i've had since my birth till today uh, that uh, i'm beyond repair that uh, truth is so distant from me that uh, i have perceived reality in such an incorrect way that uh, only death will allow the the eye that is not my body to be able to perceive reality uh, correctly because the dissonance of the true nature of reality versus the decades that I've incorrectly perceived reality would basically you know be so much dissonance it would kill it would kill me um not gonna laugh because it's not funny because that's an important revelation i think everybody fears that that's just your ego trying to hold you back to the regular amount of control ego control inertia massive i spent years struggling with this equation you know because it says straight up in jewish texts righteous people look forward to our deaths so i said okay the left i'm not going to laugh because i because I, I trusted the sages and i saw that that's what the sages said and even though you know, like what the hell? I, I'm not. Uh, I'm not going to become a suicide bomber. I'm not. Uh, I'm not. I'm, there's nothing, you know, psychologically wrong with me. But I trusted the sages, and I saw that's what the sages said, and I accepted that the sages were correct, even though I couldn't understand why the sages were correct, because everything I understood told me that that you know that's psychotic. Um, but as I've investigated the topics deeper, it makes sense to me. And then even to be able to describe it in some sort of understandable terminology uh, based on chunking theory and cognitive dissonance and just saying because, um, you know, low or high birth, because when I when I was born, I was not revealed the truth. I was revealed uh, and, you know, I was taught false ideas and I had to figure things out for myself. And most of the things I tried to figure out for myself I was incorrect about i put together patterns incorrectly and at this point as a grown man uh, so many of these misconceptions that i was taught and tried to figure out for myself have become ingrained in me that it is became my essential identity and so you know the duvid the you know the david kelton uh, that uh, has the genetics of my father and mother and the experiences that uh, from birth till today that will be the you know the David Kelton who when I die returns into the ground and will be a memory of the soul that was in this body in this material form is just one permutation of my true identity that will survive death and my true identity that so to say will be set free by death and then my true identity that looks forward to leaving this form um and not in any negative way, not in any disrespect to my parents, not in any disrespect to my teachers, and not even uh, you know some sort of karmatic way that uh, I, and I can't blame myself as a kid for misunderstanding reality and making mistakes because I just did the best uh, with the information uh, you know that I knew, and then you know following the sages to try to understand why God made the world in in this way, and then recognizing say the statement that all people. Uh, you know, what the Talmud says, you know, at death, um, at least from a Judeo-biblical uh, conception, we'll stand judgment before our Creator for all of our actions, thoughts, actions, and speech from the time our soul entered our body till it le leaves our, our body, that every person gives the same excuse. And, you know, the language in the Talmud that we were, you know, listening to the Yetzir Har, ev Evil Urge, um, or the you know language that, that I, I use is uh, just struggling with the harsh conditions of the material realm. So why did I have all these false perceptions? Uh, because I was just dealing with the harsh conditions of the material realm. In reality, 
uh, everybody. And I mentioned uh, on Week in Review, like the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle for karma. From a certain perspective, if you looked at any given person, knowing the preconditions of their karma, they probably made the most logical, reasonable decision at that time, even God forbid people who do horrible things based on their previous karma. Uh, but just like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, um, you could never know the totality of a person's karma uh, and their current situation in uh, in time and space. That's okay that my soul entered my body and exists in a certain time and place and you know, lineage and so on and so on, and that all of that pieces of information are unknowable. Uh, but in karmatic theory, so to say, we don't have free will. Given all that information, we don't actually have free will, and we did the decision that, uh, given our previous state of karma, was the determinative decision that we would have made based on the state of karma going into that decision. But it's impossible to know that state of karma that we're in that causes us to be uh, to make those actions. I, I mentioned that, and uh, and, and actually mathematics and saying Leibniz and the calculus was actually, um, from my b belief and understanding, was more meant to define the spiritual science than the material science. And it just turned out to be that calculus, the same calculus that, uh, you know, so to say, mystics and theologians developed to try to help explain the nature of the connection between the soul and the body, the spiritual and material realms, also correctly uh, defines material phenomenon that uh, these same exact formulas are useful for engineering and you know, electronics and uh, all, all these other aspects that make the gadgets and uh, devices that uh, you know that we all use today yeah just come back to what you were talking about before like uh the, about ben Watkins, uh, if you're not defining whether true is predominantly a matter of imminence or permanence those are incompatible in some sense uh, if that's not defined at the outset, your conversation is probably not going to ever land anywhere meaningful. And between the body, I am body versus I am mind, there's another thing, which is just the pure animating principle of it. So there's like three different entities, body, consciousness, and then animating principle. So then which one, if you're one of those three, well, which one are you, right? So the question is pretty complicated, but yeah, this has been a great show. Definitely mm -hmm. think we uh, frame, reframe things in a more comprehensive way. Even to put it on, you know, to put me and Jennifer on the same page that we could move forward with our, our research and then try to be intelligible, sounding to other people and, and, and you know, even recognize, um, you know, kind of like a harsh reality. Like, you know, my father, you know, maybe, you know, like uh, you are saying, like, these people do not like you. They're not really your friends. You take your education seriously and, and saying that my dad wasn't trying to you make me not have any friend. He just wanted me to take my education seriously. And uh, from a religious perspective, you know, if you have children, you're trying to teach them right from wrong in your nature of trying to teach them an ontology of, uh, you know, saying, OK, you are the body. Take care of your body. Be careful what you do. Uh, but the essential you is not your body. And I'm also concerned about what's going to happen to your soul after you die and uh, you versus uh, just say the body's one of their possessions that it's their most important possession because it's the home of their soul. Well, you as a mother will have decide how you're going to raise your children or you as a teacher, how you teach your students. Um, but you know, in terms of internet debate and discourse, then you're talking about, uh, you know, in the open marketplace of ideas or arenas trying to ex express these systems and then also just saying like you know as a person who's been in the big real you know dangerous world that there's different people who see things differently and trying to express you know like multiple truth hypothesis or understanding of how different people see the world and how that might lead to different predictions uh, you know so say if someone is predicting that there's a soul that will leave the body after death and that's important in terms of uh, what you should do versus someone said there is no soul and there is nothing that survives death in in terms of uh you know you could have parents that are atheists and parents that are uh theists and they're going to raise their kids 
possibly different based on uh, those axioms or assumptions and if you're in the world dealing with different people with different assumptions to have some sort of uh, you know metaphysics or system to deal with that and you know I've been doing interfaith for a long time that's why I developed uh, the multiple truth hypothesis because I wanted to take people serious in their beliefs when people have belief systems and rituals and you're like oh, that's just dumb that's just false and uh, you're giving the benefit of the doubt maybe it's true maybe your ritual uh, and belief system is an accurate description of some sort of connection between a spiritual realm and the material realm and then working with these uh, you know, what appear to be conflicting systems or what may factually be conflicting systems and uh, and even to hypothesize that uh, if they are factually conflicting systems that uh, maybe they're not uh, mutually exclusive and then try to explain that and then you know send the, the academic method where you have to uh, look you know presumably I'm not the first person who did interfaith or thought about these things and probably the great minds of previous generations also tried to get people together who had different belief systems and ontologies and in fact they did and uh, you know so that's why I'm always talking about Plato and Leibniz and uh, you know the sages and so on and so on. Yeah, it's absolutely wonderful. I wish more people took religion as seriously as you do. It's used me to chuckle. I got because these guys stop like, wishing. There is trolling in the chat. That's what I. Was saying, that's, I see that. Yeah, I see the laughter is the distance. But saying like like I'm wishing, or saying that uh, the material reality, like I don't wish. I, you know, like I wish gravity just stopped. You know, saying that this is the material reality, and trying to understand, you know, God's greatness in that way, and. Uh, in, in these complicated, you know, statements from the sages, like so I'm, 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 you know, like I'm, I submit and humble myself before God, and uh, in some kind of wish for things to change in that realm, I'm going to submit, you know, like, avow myself to the system, and uh, recognize that uh, um, the way I see things is likely inaccurate, and and um, try to keep on resolving the, you know, accept the dissonance in order to have a higher understanding of truth and do, you know, do public good, create good karma, help people improve their life in, in a way that makes sense, um, you know, be combative, you know, so to say that uh, accept some of the statement of the sages that evil has the home court advantage in the material realm. So if I'm on the side of good, uh, that I'm going to lose most battles in the material realm because that's the nature of how things work. And so if you have a different ontology, you say I'm on the side of good and I expect to win in the material realm. You could understand a system like that, but you're saying whatever sages you follow in the, those different uh, ontologies and you know, like squid games. I actually, I, 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 I I didn't watch Squid Game. I'm not going to, I didn't watch. Queen I don't even game. know what that is. And it sounds disgusting, but uh, yeah, it's, it's because Maya, is the principal component of manifestation. And Maya basically means illusion. So there yeah, will so always be an intrinsic confusion to any type of a, quote, empirical undertaking. You could compare the Matrix to Squid Game, but Squid Game is much more violent and um, and you know, dystopian, so to say. Um, but say, you know, why is that the most popular thing in the world? Uh, because there's probably some sort of dystopian mapping that people have a natural intuition that uh, the material realm is stacked against us, so to say that, you know, so to say bad has the home court advantage in the material realm. And that's also the bend towards dualism. Wow, that is an amazing quote. You're saying that good wins out um, because the soul survives death. And because there's a spiritual realm, if it was just the material realm, uh, you know, so evil having the home court advantage. So dystopian realities of, of the Matrix or Squid Games makes sense to the average person that, uh, you know, saying that the material realm is stacked. It, the odds are it's rigged against us. Um, you're just saying that everybody knew uh, that when we were born, that death, there, there's, you know, death and taxes, you can't escape uh, or so on and so on. Uh but uh, you know, that the, this idea that mind, the I that is me, is not part of this physical realm. So even though the physical realm 
we were talking about mathematics and mind. Um, I think Jennifer made that meme. Uh, I mean, she just shared with uh, you. Know, I, I said on the chess server that the same mind that we use to observe the physical realm is the same mind that observes the spiritual realm. And if the person thinks that the material realm is the only thing that exists, they're mistaken because the mind is actually part of the spiritual realm and the mind factually does observe the spiritual realm, even if we don't realize it. Spiritual realm animates the mind. The mind performs observations within itself. Like it's waveform reducing into itself. That's why there's a reduction in one area and an amplification elsewhere. So there's a conservation. Like always just bring it back to Heisenberg. Because it's it, it eventually builds up from Heisenberg principle, right? Like you got to bring it down to just a single slit. What's happening? Okay, the thing's 3D. And then it's compressing. It's still technically 3D, but now it's a disc. It's not a sphere anymore. Okay, what's happening? It's going to one place. But we only care about the distribution. How does that relate to other things? Well... Free will is actually superposition state, so it's not just one of them. It's the entire distribution times a bunch of other distributions together in one giant whole. So that's like the basic picture. It's just too complicated to really work with as one entity. So then it's just a series of strategic breakdowns, chunking, as you say. Best metaphors for it, basically. So I think math is as good a place as any, probably one of the better places to start. So I do appreciate Dubit being serious about this and I look forward to the next one, whatever it uh, entails. Yeah, great. And I said, uh, you know, I spent three years, almost three years in Israel. I never got tired of studying and talking about this stuff. You just said, you know, my life went on. I went back to America and New York. I spent years studying and talking about this. Anyone who knows me, so this is majority what I talk about or interested in. Uh, but, you know, we're in the material realm. We have to live. You know, Jennifer, we've been three years almost, and I don't think either one of us are tired about talking uh, about these things. And so you hear more about it, but, you know, so they want to make progress. And, uh, you know, just like I left Israel after a while, there's uh, you know, things to accomplish, and you have to learn and have to, uh, you know, so I, I wanted to uh, um, push myself and push Jennifer to uh, be more serious about this and, and, uh, you know, I saw them reviewing the math, uh, even if it was somewhat low quality content that's not really going to be useful for someone to watch is like a math tutorial. Uh, but it's likely of things, you know, uh, more to come. And, uh, you know, hopefully we can review. We'll get more technical. I'm not sure if, uh, you know, Jennifer is going to be making, I'm encouraging her to do more uh, streams on her channel and uh, it, it'll probably be, you know, more math and more. Uh, technical like that and, and hope so and then also the conversations and you know, the communication theory that uh, there's actually communication actually real communication ideas um, and understanding between people and, and you know what that means so appreciate it uh, thanks for coming on Jennifer as always and look forward to week in review this Sunday uh, Charles uh, wanted to postpone Thursday, so I think we're going to do our, our thing Friday at noon. I'd offer to bring Claire on, but there might be a scheduling conflict, so it should be Charles at noon, and, uh, and if not, we'll reschedule to next week, and I, I might try to bring some guests on Charles for the next few weeks, and I, I thought I'd have Claire just because uh, she's been asking me for so long, and uh, you know, so we'll see about that, and, and uh, you know, hopefully we'll be able to uh, make week in review more uh at least segment of it where people could come on at least for a short amount of time if they're not capable of these more productive uh esoteric conversations just to come on and, and maybe help book more future conversations and uh streams so uh, thanks a lot jennifer and uh, have a great week you too see you soon